Hi guys, this is another lecture video looking at fiscal and supply side policy. This time we're going to be looking at government debt. We're going to meet some of the UK context around the government debt, uh, explore the role of deficits in the economy, and discuss some of the different economic perspectives on deficit, deficits and their impacts. Let's, let's dive into some UK context on government debt. But before we do, we need to think to about bathtubs. Here's a rather nice one. In order to understand what we mean by government debt compared to deficits and surpluses, we need to think of the difference between a stock concept and a flow concept. So imagine the bathtub is full of government debt. Flowing into government debt comes our government spending. The more the government spends, the more the debt increases. Taking away from government debt is tax revenue. As the government taxes and raises money, it can reduce its debt. Now here's the key idea. A deficit or a surplus uh, is a flow concept. It's something that's moving every year, like water coming in or out of a bathtub. What we mean by a deficit or a surplus is the difference between tax revenue and government spending. So a fiscal deficit would be where government spending is greater than taxation, the government spending more than it's receiving. But a surplus would mean the opposite, where the government is spending less than it's receiving in tax. A balanced budget is where the two are equal. Tax spending and the deficit or surplus are all flow concepts. They're things that move. They're like water going in or out of a bathtub. Whereas the amount of debt is a stock concept. It's just accumulated over time. If we run a deficit, the debt will keep going up and up and up. And it's therefore something we call a stock concept, like the water in the bathtub. We often measure debt as a percentage of GDP because that gives us a better indication of the burden of that debt on the economy over time and between different economies. Crucial thing to make sure you've understood first is the difference between a flow and a stock. A flow is something that is moving over time. A stock is something that accumulates. UK government debt, by way of context, we've met this graph before, rose in the last few years. Um, you can see it spiking around 2008 as a result of the uh, financial crisis. Um, but it's been much higher than that before. Historically, or in comparison to other countries, UK debt is high but not particularly high. There are some countries like Japan and Greece which have extraordinarily high levels of, G of debt relative to their GDP. The UK is a fairly middling amount. There are lots of other developed countries like the US which have similar amounts. China, just by way of context, 47% debt to GDP, that's a bit lower. Um, there are some countries, Hong Kong's got extremely low levels of debt. So that's some concept on what we mean by government debt. It's contributed to by a surplus in the government's budget. Let's have a think about, uh, in a bit more detail, into those, uh, let's think about those deficits in a bit more detail. Two different types of deficit. A cyclical budget deficit is the part of a budget deficit related to our economic cycle. In one of our previous videos, we spoke about automatic uh, and discretionary fiscal stabilizers. This really relates to the automatic part of that. In a recession, this part of the deficit will automatically increase because government spending rises as more people are unemployed, so they're paying more unemployment benefits. And tax revenues fall because there are fewer people working and incomes have fallen. Therefore, they're receiving less in income tax. In a boom, the opposite would happen. The deficit decreases. It might even become a surplus because governments end up spending less and taxing more. Um, especially under a Keynesian regime, we're interested in a cyclical budget deficit, the part of the budget that moves from deficit to surplus. But there's also part of the budget which is more structural. That's the part of the budget deficit that isn't related to the economic cycle. We're thinking of uh, long-term financing decisions. So, for instance, how much I spend on education or the NHS. It's not hugely dependent on the cycle. It's a longer-term decision. It's very hard to measure. I'd have to take an average over the whole economic cycle to work out what the structural deficit is, but it's very hard to do that in practice. It's really about persistent overspending. A structural budget deficit means the government is spending too much money over time. A number of things might factor into that that link to structural changes in an economy. So, for instance, changes in my demographics in the country will affect it. The dependency ratio refers to the number of uh, the proportion of people who are working or of working age 
compared to the proportion of people who are under the age of 16 or over the age of 65. The UK has quite a high dependency ratio because we've got an ageing population, which means there's reduced tax revenues and increased spending because the government's having to support that ageing population. That means uh, there's more likely to be this structural budget deficit. Similarly, in the UK in the last 100 years, we've seen more deindustrialization, globalization, and that's mean more companies are relocating or routing their money through other countries, which means reduced corporate tax revenues, again, relating to a structural budget deficit, persistent spending more than is being received. The size of existing debt influences structural deficits. If uh, the deficit is quite high, that means that more is going to be paid in debt interest already, which means there's automatically uh, a deficit built in. In the UK in 2020, um, we're planning on spending £56 billion pounds at just covering debt interest. So big amounts of pre-existing debt drive more spending and mean it's more likely that there'll be a structural budget deficit. Really key distinction between structural and cyclical budget deficits. We might be able to see it in the UK in, 2000, in the early 2000s. The UK was growing quite strongly. There was a, a boom period. And yet there was still growing debt and a budget deficit. And that might give us evidence of a structural deficit, persistent overspending. Ideally, we'd see uh, the, the debt decreasing in a boom as the government runs uh, a, a budget surplus. It's not what we saw. A bit of application to do before we move on. In the exam, this could come up in a number of ways. We're likely to see a 15 mark along these lines, but we have to explain the causes of budget deficits. Um, please could you pause this video and have a go at planning that question. Remember, with a 15 marker, we're looking for two or maybe three points. The key idea is a chain of analysis, explaining it step by step, but also some context, and hopefully I've given you loads of context. Don't worry about doing a super detailed plan, but aim to get maybe a few lines down in uh, planning to that question. If you're feeling confident on that, here's a slightly trickier question, um, focusing just on the structural aspect of budget deficits. So pause this video and have a think about those two questions. Great, so hopefully you had a think. Uh, I'll put up another video uh, talking through some of those questions. There's a variety of different economic perspectives on what we make of deficits and on how we feel about them. And as usual, we're going to make the simple distinction of breaking it down as Keynesian and classical economists. Keynesians argue that cyclical deficits are really important to help kind of flatten the economic cycle. We showed this in the last video with automatic stabilisers. Uh, the idea that fiscal stabilisers can limit the size of the boom and the size of the recession. And Keynesians would argue that government spending should be deliberately targeted, so discretionary fiscal stabilisers should be used to achieve this. In a recession, they argue that the high multiplier, perhaps because of crowding in, plus slow uh, market adjustments, the market's slow to adjust in a recession, means that fiscal policy is really necessary, it's really effective to ensure a quick recovery. In a boom, they'd argue that uh, we might want to run a, a budget surplus in order to fund future deficit spending in a recession. They'd argue that that produces less, volatile, uh, less volatility in our economic cycle, which means more certainty for firms and for consumers and for workers. And that means more long-run growth because we can get more investment and innovation in the economy. This policy is known as counter-cyclical demand management policy. That's a mouthful, isn't it? But let's look at what the classical economists have to say. And traditionally, classical economists have argued that deficits are bad because of the risk of structural deficits. Structural deficits, that persistent overspending, are really worth avoiding. They're really problematic. They argue that Keynesian policy just doesn't work. It's really hard to time it right. And we might see, we might, if we looked at the data, we might find a bit more evidence for this view that in practice, it's very hard to do this kind of counter-cyclical demand management policy. It's far too easy to run a deficit in a boom. It requires really tight fiscal discipline for a government to say that they're going to run a surplus, especially if it's a new political party who's come into power, like we saw with, arguably with Labour in the early 2000s. They'd also point to this idea that we've met before of crowding out. The government spending as a tool for economic management is usually quite ineffective because it reduces private investment. It's therefore ineffective as a way to manage the macroeconomy. Classical economists usually therefore argue for quite a small government, that means low government spending, low taxation, and a balanced 
uh, government budget. Let's go a step further and think about the impacts of those deficits. We've seen some economic perspectives which get us to grips with that, but there's a few more ideas if we're going to convincingly evaluate uh, the idea that governments should run a deficit. Arguing for deficits, we've seen a few things. Keynesian views, Keynesians argue that they're really good to manage the economic cycle. And it's always worth pointing out, even though it's not a very strong point, the deficits do contribute to short-run economic growth. Even if they're bad long-term, in the short run there's a benefit. But there's obvious negatives. They're expensive. We won't dig into this because there's not much theory, but you might want to use that piece of context that the UK is planning on spending 56 billion just on debt interest in 2020. And two concepts that we need to meet, uh, financial crowding out, crowding out and debt crises. Financial crowding out is very similar. Well, it's just crowding out. We've met crowding out before, but this is going into a little bit more detail about the impact of borrowing. If governments have to borrow from financial institutions, that's going to push up interest rates, leading to less private investment and less consumption. Suppose the UK government were to try and borrow 40 billion by issuing 40 billion of bonds. In order to convince lenders to buy those bonds and lend the money, they're going to have to offer a higher interest rate. The problem is if those lenders know they can get that high interest rate on bonds, they're going to demand the same interest rate on other borrowing. Otherwise, why bother? They might as well just buy the bonds. And that means firms are less likely to invest because the cost of borrowing has just gone up. Consumers are less likely to consume because consumption financed by borrowing, so particularly buying houses and buying cars, is going to become more expensive. So when governments have to run a deficit, that can mean that we get less investment, less spending and less economic activity in general. And that limits our Keynesian arguments for a deficit. Another idea that's really crucial is the idea of debt crises. Deficits are bad because obviously in the long run we can't keep borrowing. Excessive borrowing risks a debt crisis, which is basically where a government goes bankrupt. Here's the idea, if we keep borrowing, lenders become less confident. And so they demand higher and higher interest rates if we're going to keep borrowing from them. As bond yields, these interest rates go up. That in turn means that a government has to spend more money on the debt interest. Remember, 56 billion in the UK in 2020. In order to finance spending money on debt interest, they're going to have to borrow more because they can't necessarily just reduce taxation. That's going to make lenders less confident, it's going to push interest rates up further, and eventually the end point of this cycle is that the government has to default, which means it effectively goes bankrupt um, and the currency collapses. It's bad news. Best example of this um, recently was last decade or so, it was Greece uh, in the early 2010s. Complex chart, we're looking at um, Greece, which is the blue line, but you can see that all the Greece bond yields have been very high. 25% interest rate on Greek bond yields is very high. But after 2008, they absolutely spiked again, hitting almost 30%. Now, the Greek, um, Greece near default, it never actually collapsed and it kept being bailed out by the ECB, the European Central Bank. It never quite defaulted, but it came extremely close. And we can see here the impacts in debt on debt. Uh, the impact of debt on government bond yields. Debt produces an extraordinary, uh, can be extraordinarily effective in pushing bond yields up, and that makes borrowing hugely expensive. At that rate of uh, interest, the Greek government was having to pay a huge amount in debt interest, and so it was just having to borrow in uh, vast amounts in order to fund it. Bad news. So a few different pros and cons of deficits, and really when we evaluate deficits, we want to our framework wants to be this classical versus Keynesian idea. Keynesians argue for cyclical deficits, but classical economists are really nervous of structural deficits. And they particularly point to financial crowding out and debt crises as reasons to avoid deficits altogether, just to be safe. The application of this in the exam is going to depend. Uh, it'll often, like all this policy stuff, link to other objectives, and we're likely to have to write some questions comparing it. We'll look at them down the line. But here's a question that we might be able to have a, a stab at after this, uh, this video. Evaluate the view that a balanced budget should always be a major macroeconomic objective for governments. So in other words, should governments put more priority on balancing their budget than they have historically? In other words, do we take the Keynesian view that cyclical, budgets, cyclical budget deficits are, are valuable? Or do we take the classical view? 
that we really shouldn't uh, run uh, budget deficits at all. Remember with a 25 marker, we're looking for two sides to the argument with a nice change of analysis, a bit of evaluation for each side, some context and application throughout, and a justified conclusion. Spend 15 or so minutes doing a detailed plan for this question. If you're struggling, I'm going to put up another video just talking through how I might go about doing it. But have a go at planning it before you watch that, and only turn to that video if you're really struggling.